In the early stages of new imperialism, Africa was called the Dark Continent, mostly because Europeans had very little knowledge of it. The native people were distinct and spoke, to, spoke over a thousand languages. Their civilizations were somewhat advanced. They had been using iron for over 2,000 years and were adept in the arts of sculpture and weaving. But its populations were weakened by intertribal wars and slave trade. These made Africa susceptible to European intervention and domination. The continent was attractive to Europeans because of its wealth of resources, notably copper, cotton, rubber, palm oil, cocoa, diamonds, gold, tea, and tin. In 1841, a Scottish man named David Livingston arrived in Africa as a medical missionary. He was devoted to humanitarian and religious work and had no political or economic aims. Rumors spread that Livingston was lost somewhere in Africa, so in 1869, the New York Herald sent journalist Henry Morton Stanley to find him. Stanley found Livingston in the town of Ujiji on October 27, 1871. They explored the continent together for two years until Livingston died of malaria and dysentery on May 1, 1873. After Livingston's death, Stanley remained in the continent and began to see the economic opportunities in Africa. He was quick to share this idea with the King of Belgium, Leopold II, who decided to develop Congo and founded the International Congo Association with Stanley in 1878. Its goal was to establish control of Congo and exploit its economic resources. The ICA was a private enterprise and was meant to be exclusive property of the king. The story of Livingston and Stanley is analogous to the role of Europe in Africa. It started out as humanitarian, like Livingston, and transformed into opportunistic, like Stanley. Europeans considered Africa terra nullius, which meant land belonging to no one or no man's land. There was an enormous pressure for European nations to colonize in Africa, and even Germany, despite its initial hesitation to expand its reign outside Middle Europa, joined the rush for territory. Carl Peters was a German explorer who worked in Zanzibar, signing treaties with the chiefs of East Africa to join the German Empire. Other nations were also taking extreme measures to carve out their territory. French explorer Pierre de Braza distributed the French, French flag all along the Congo River, which was in itself a larger territory than France. Portugal joined their colonies of Angola and Mozambique into a trans-African empire supported by Britain. Leaders of all nations felt that this was the moment to colonize in Africa, and if they missed it, it would be too late. Bismarck called a conference in Berlin in 1885 to discuss the African question and to submit it to international regulation. Most European states, and even the United States, sent representatives to attend. Its two main goals were to draft a code that would govern how European countries would acquire territory in Africa, and to set up territories of the Congo Association as an international state. Several rules were established at the Berlin Conference of 1885 that determined how a European nation should make imperial claims on territory in Africa. A scramble for real occupation quickly followed the conference. It took a total of only 15 years for the entire continent to be distributed, except for Ethiopia, which remained independent, and Liberia, which was a U.S. protectorate. Each country followed a set process of African colonization. First would come the appearance of European representatives with treaties for the chiefs of tribes to sign. The treaties usually get granted the chief the powers to convey sovereignty, sell land, or grant mining concessions as long as he conceded to European oversight and rule. Next, the Europeans would build up the position of the chief, since language and cultural barriers impeded their influence over the people of each tribe. This was a system called indirect rule, which meant that colonial authorities acted through existing chiefs to establish control. The Berlin Conference also made a decision on the matter of Congo. It created the Congo Free State, which was to replace the International Congo Association. This new state was not the colony of any power, including Belgium, but it was administered by Leopold II. Its boundaries made it as big as, United, as the United States, east of the Mississippi. It was internationalized, with free trade, no tariffs on imports, and the suppression of slavery. This decision was secured by the Brussels Conference of 1889, which took further steps to end slavery, to protect the rights of local people, and to reduce the traffic of liquor and firearms. However, these efforts eventually failed because there was no international force in Africa that could enforce them. Although slavery was banned, Leopold II wanted to profit from the, re 
from the region, and this led to what is known today as a humanitarian disaster. There was a high demand for rubber in Europe and Africa, which led to the abuse of exploitation of workers in the Congo because it was one of the world's only sources of supply. Leopold II implemented a harsh forced labor policy with impossible quotas under brutal conditions, which resulted in the deaths of thousands of workers. Congo workers who failed to meet rubber collection quotas were often punished by having their hands cut off. Though Leopold II was able to generate significant profits from this, he wanted more capital for further development. He therefore borrowed from the Belgian government in 1889 and 1895 in return for giving the government the right to annex it in 1901. The government refused this, op the, this offer this year, but in 1904, public outrage over Leopold's abuse in Congo eventually forced the Belgian government to take over the territory in 1908. The Congo Free State then became the Belgian Congo as a colony of Belgium. This ended forced labor within the colony. The labor problem in Congo also existed in other African colonies. Europeans tried to abolish slavery and replace it for paid work, but the African people had very little expectation of individual gain and no use for money. Therefore, they only worked sporadically and resented tedious work. Europeans had to resort to forced labor to extract resources from the continent. An example of this type of system was the French Corvée, which was a forced labor system for road building. Other methods to access workers were also used. In some cases, the chief would supply a quota of men to work. His motivation for doing this was to seem more important in the eyes of the European officials who were authorities to him and could grant him more powers. European nations would also levy taxes on African people so that they were forced to work to earn money to be able to survive. Another method was that the European government might allocate land to the Europeans so that natives could no longer live on given lands or natives were moved to reservations. These techniques uprooted Africans and demoralized them, disregarding any pre-existing social or political systems. Conditions eventually improved in the 20th century, but the labor systems still caused resentment in Africa and gave rise to nationalism in each territory.